Hi everyone, welcome back to High School Science 101 and today we are revising some key chemistry skills and content by looking at one specific element and unpacking six key pieces of information that we can identify about that element purely based on what we're given in the periodic table or in a test. Let's get started. The first thing that you might get asked in a test is to identify the element or the symbol of the element. And in this case, we are given the symbol K, and that represents the element potassium. But you might be thinking, well, why is potassium represented by the symbol K when you've got a whole bunch of other elements whose symbols come from the first letter or first couple of letters of their name? Like C is carbon, H is hydrogen, HE is helium. And the reason is there's a group of elements whose symbol comes from the Latin name of the element. So in this case, uh, K comes from the Latin name for potassium, which is callium, but you've also got Na, which is natrium, and that's the Latin name for sodium. But then you've also got a bunch of others like Pb is lead, Sn is tin, but in this case, K is potassium. So it's just a matter of memorizing or being aware of some of those tricky elements whose symbols come from the Latin name for those elements. The second thing that you might get asked is to identify the atomic number and the mass number. And in most periodic tables, it's arranged like this. And the top number is your atomic number, the bottom number is the mass number. If it is rearranged, you can also try and remember that the smaller number is the atomic number, with the exception of hydrogen, where they're pretty much always the same. Um, the smaller number is the atomic number, the bigger number is the mass number. And these two numbers are really important because they can tell you some key information about this element. For instance, this 19, sure it tells us that it's the 19th element on the periodic table, but it also tells us that there's 19 protons. And if you recall, in the center of an atom, we have the nucleus, and the nucleus has our neutrons that have no charge, and it has our protons, which have a positive charge. And flying around the outside of the nucleus, we have our electrons, and electrons have a negative charge. Okay, so this 19, this atomic number of 19, tells us that not only is it the 19th element, but there's 19 protons in the nucleus of a potassium atom. This bigger number here is the mass number, and in this case, it's a decimal number. So what we need to do is just firstly round it to the nearest whole number. So we're going to round it down to just 39. Okay, so our mass number is going to be 39. All right. Um, this 39 is your protons and your neutrons added together. We already know that there's 19 protons. So how many neutrons must there be? Um, there's 20. Okay, because 19 plus 20 gives us our mass number of 39. So based on our atomic number and our mass number, we can therefore say that there are 19 protons, there's 19 electrons. So I'll do a little E with a negative charge because that's the, that's the shorthand for electrons. Um, it's 19 because um, when we're looking at elements from the periodic table, we're not, we're assuming that they have a balanced charge. Okay. So protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. If we've got 19 positive protons in the nucleus, we therefore have 19 negative electrons flying around that side. So 19 protons plus 19 electrons negative gives us a balanced charge. Okay. So 19 protons and we have 19 electrons to balance out that charge. And then we've just worked out from the mass number that there's 20 neutral neutrons that don't have any charge. Okay. And remember our atomic number was 19 and our mass number was 39. We rounded it down to 39. 
that last point really covered questions two and three because question two was looking at the atomic number and the mass number, the atomic number being 19 and the mass number being 39. And the third question was about identifying the number of protons, electrons and neutrons, which we've done here. So let's move on to question four, which is now that we've got the number of electrons, can we draw an electron shell diagram? So I've done a video on this before, so if, you have, if you're not sure about this, if I go through too quickly, be sure to check out that video. But let's start off by drawing the nucleus. And with an electron shell diagram, we're usually not too concerned with drawing all of the uh, protons and neutrons in the center because it's an electron shell diagram. So we're just really interested in the arrangement of the electrons. So we're going to represent the nucleus in the middle by just the letter K and a bubble. And so we're going to start off with the first two electrons. And the first shell holds two electrons and then it's full. Um, I'm saying the word shells because in the context of this skill and this type of diagram, we tend to use the word shells, but in reality, um, it's probably better to use the word clouds because the electrons don't orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun. They buzz around all over the place, um, but they're confined within a particular area. And we call that area a cloud. But in this case, we're going to use the term shells. So the first two electrons are in the first shell. And now the second shell begins to fill up. So we've got 19 electrons. We've done the first two. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So now that this second shell has eight electrons, we say that that's full. And let's move on to a third shell now and start filling that up. So we've got 10 so far, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, and we say that this third shell is now full. Later on, when you learn about uh, bigger elements and bigger atoms, you'll learn that there's subshells and um, we tend to fit more electrons into these lower level shells. But for now, we say that the third shell is full. So this 19th electron, the last electron, will sit on its own in a fourth shell here. Okay, so we've got two in the first shell, eight in the second, eight in the third, and this last 19th electron hangs out on its own in this fourth shell. The next thing you might get asked is to identify its electron configuration. And we've done a shell diagram, so we can determine the configuration just based on the diagram. We can go, okay, we've got two in the first shell. Um, let's write it over here. So two in the first shell. We've got eight in the second, eight in the third, and then one in the fourth shell. Okay, and this is what we call the electron configuration. So we can determine that quite easily from this diagram, but another way that you can determine that is by looking at the periodic table and look at where the element sits in that table. In this case, potassium sits in the uh, first group and the fourth period. The period tells you how many shells there are. And because it's in the fourth period, that tells us that it has four shells. And if we you know, look at the diagram, one, two, three, four, okay? Um, the fact that it's in the first group tells us that it's got one electron in its outermost shell or its valence shell, all right? So we can determine the configuration based on the diagram or simply based on where it is in the periodic table. The last thing I want to cover in this lesson is what type of ion potassium is going to become. So when we're looking at ions, we're really just looking at the number of electrons in this outermost shell. An ion, if you recall, is when an atom has gained or lost electrons. And generally speaking, the number of protons, positive protons in an atom, is balanced out by the number of negative electrons. So in this case, 19 protons are balanced out by these 19 electrons. Um, but atoms also like to have a full outer shell. And in this case, it doesn't. We've got this one electron in this outer shell. So what potassium is going to do is it's going to um, find another atom that wants to gain an electron and it's going to give this electron away to another atom that wants to actually gain that electron. And if it gives this electron away to another atom or another element, then this is removed. Let's just rub this out, actually. So this whole shell doesn't exist anymore because it's given away that one electron that it had in that shell. And now we can see 
that potassium has a full outer shell because this third one has eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then potassium is happy, it's got a full outer shell, but because it gave away that electron, um, and remember electrons have a negative charge, so it's given away something that has a negative charge. It's given away one little subatomic particle that has a negative charge. So because of that, when we write it, we say it's K plus, okay? There's an invisible one there. It's like K one plus, okay? But because it's just one, we just go K plus. Um, you get things like calcium, for example, that give away two electrons to get a full outer shell. And so that becomes two plus. Um, if an atom or an element is gaining electrons, then it's gaining these particles that have a negative charge. Um, so an, an example of that would be chlorine. Chlorine tends to gain one electron to have a full outer shell. And because it's gaining one, it'll become Cl minus. There's an invisible one there. Um, and so on. So in this case, potassium has given away that electron. So its ion is K plus. Okay. Um, we say that this is a cation. Okay, positive ions are cations. Negative ones are anions. All right, but in this case, we've got a positive one, it's a cation. That's the type of ion that potassium becomes. So that's it for today. We've covered chemical symbols and we've talked about how, you know, the, the symbol represents the name of the element. We've covered atomic number and mass number. We've talked about what those numbers tell us in terms of the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons within the atom. Uh, then we've used that information to draw an electron shell diagram, and we've also um, identified the electron configuration. And then lastly, we finished up by identifying what type of ion the element can become based on whether it's gaining or losing electrons. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.